And so Paul leaves Ephesus at the end of chapter 19, and he goes again to Greece. We're still um, on the third missionary journey. He, apart, he departs again. He goes to Macedonia. He travels through many districts, and he arrives in Greece Verse uh, at the end of verse 2. He spends three months there, and uh, he wants to go back, and, and there's a plot against him. He's being followed. They want to kill him. He's about to go to Syria because he really wants to get to Jerusalem. That's where he ultimately wants to go. But he's going to return through Macedonia, and he has several traveling companions with him, and they wait on the coastal town of, um, they're, they're waiting for him in Troas. Luke is with him, verse 6. He's sailing from Philippi, which is the first place he went to in Greece. Now he's leaving Greece, and he's going to a place called Troas. When he gets to Troas, he preaches, and he preaches a long sermon. I like that because it makes me feel better if I preach too long. Paul preached a long sermon. It was night. There were lamps in the room, and evidently there were three levels in the room he was preaching in. And up in the third level, there was a young boy. Now, let me tell you, you know, have you ever heard the expression, I think you have the expression in in Russian, he talks in his sleep, or she talks in, his, in her sleep. Well, you know what a preacher does? A preacher talks in somebody else's sleep. I've been a pastor for 34 years, and very, very often when I preach, I see somebody sleeping. It just happens. It hurts your feelings a little bit, but you realize, well, maybe they didn't, maybe they stayed up late, maybe they didn't get enough sleep. And you know, sometimes when I go to church and I'm not preaching, sometimes I close my eyes <laughs> and sometimes I rest. So you understand it and you get over it and you do the best you can. But you know, Paul had that same experience. And there was a young man, and we're told his name. His name was Eutychus. And he fell asleep at church. He fell asleep during the sermon. And he was in the upper level. And what he did is he fell off. He fell off the upper level. He fell off the third level. And he fell all the way down to the ground floor. And evidently, he broke his neck because the fall killed him. He was picked up dead. It says in verse 10 that Paul goes to him. He embraces him and he raises him from the dead. Now, this is the second great resurrection in the book of Acts. Maybe there are three. There, there are at least two. Tabitha, also called Dorcas, raised by Peter in Acts 9 in Joppa. Eutychus, raised by Paul at Troas, Acts chapter 20. And maybe, maybe, Paul raised after he was stoned in Acts 14 at Lystra. We're told about three resurrections in the gospel besides the resurrection of Christ. The widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter, and Lazarus. We're told about two resurrections and maybe three resurrections in the book of Acts. You know, probably, was well, certainly, the Lord Jesus raised many people from the dead, but we're only told about three. Probably the apostles raised many people from the dead, but we're only told about three. Two or three. In each case, we are given enough facts for it to be disproven if it did not happen. Jairus was a synagogue leader in Galilee. Everyone would have known who Jairus was because he was famous. He was a synagogue leader. 
If Jesus did not raise his 12-year-old daughter from the dead, everyone would have known that he didn't raise him from the dead, raise her from the dead. So to make the claim if it didn't happen would have been madness. It would not have helped the gospel, it would have hurt the gospel. Nain was a little tiny town. It was a tiny village. We, we're not even sure where, where it is today or where it was. There could have only been one widow in Nain whose son died before she did. If Jesus did not raise somebody from the dead in Nain, everybody would have known that he didn't do it. Bethany was near Jerusalem. Not everyone in Jerusalem would have known someone in Bethany, but everybody in Bethany would have known someone in Jerusalem. Mary and Martha and Lazarus were well known in Bethany. If Jesus did not raise Lazarus from the dead in Bethany, everyone would have known it. Now, everyone knew who Tabitha was. She was famous. If Peter did not raise her from the dead, if that was a false claim, it would have hurt the gospel. It would not have helped the gospel. This young man fell in a crowd of people. Everybody knew that he was dead. If Paul did not raise him from the dead, but they claimed that he was raised from the dead, everybody would know it was a false claim because there were lots of witnesses. When the Bible claims that a resurrection has taken place, the location is always named. A family relationship is always named or the name of the person is given. There's always lots of data so you can specify the exact people in the exact place at the exact time so that if people want to say it didn't happen, they can go there and discover that it, whether it happened or not. It can be proven in that generation, in that place. So this boy falls asleep, he falls down, he dies. Paul raises him from the dead. Verse 12 says, they took the boy away alive and they were greatly comforted. You know, they had communion there, they had fellowship, and then Paul left. Now, he's trying to get to Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost. He goes down to the coast. He's trying to catch a boat. And um, what happens at this time is that the leaders from the church in Ephesus go down to meet him. The elders of the church come from Ephesus to the port place in Miletus where Paul meets with them for the last time. He led them to Christ. He planted the church there. He's trying to get to Jerusalem. Remember on the second, uh, on the second missionary journey, they asked him to stay in Ephesus. He said no, but that he would come back. Now on the third missionary journey, they come to talk with him. He's going to leave them and he's not coming back. It's a heartbreaking scene. He knows that they're never going to see him again. So the leaders of the church come to meet with him before he gets on the ship one last time. And Luke records what Paul says to the elders before he gets on the ship. This is called Paul's charge to the Ephesian elders, Acts chapter 20. It's one of the most famous scenes in the book of Acts. And Paul outlines his pastoral philosophy. Paul outlines his church strategy, his ministry strategy. And he also gives a summary of his ministry in this in this passage. And he talks about how comprehensive his plans were. He didn't just do one little thing. He did lots of big things while not neglecting the little things. And he said, um, you know how I spent time with you. You know, this is one of the dangers of what we call uh, the electronic church. This is one of the dangers of what we call disembodied ministry. What do I mean by that? Tapes are wonderful. CDs are wonderful. DVDs are wonderful. What we're doing right now 
uh, hopefully, is going to be heard by people who've never been in this room, who never meet us, radio broad who never shake our hands. Radio broadcasts can be wonderful. Television broadcasts can be wonderful. But you know, there's no substitute to life-on-life -life ministry, face-to-face -face ministry, touching people, talking to people, being in the same room with them. A, a time will never come in the history of the church where we don't need to spend time with the people that we're ministering to. And what Paul says, the first thing he says is, you know that as soon as I came to your neighborhood, I was with you all the time. I spent time with you. You know, we have a saying in ministry, people don't, know, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't want to be dazzled by great teaching. People want to be loved by their teachers. People want to be related to. People want to know that, that they're cared for. And that's the kind of ministry that Paul had in Ephesus. That's what he did when he was there. He spent time with people. He cared for them like a shepherd. Look at verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials. Serving the Lord with tears, um, with heartbreak. Suffering has a way of turning people away from ministry. The last place I lived in America was Memphis, Tennessee. It's a great town. It's a great southern town. It's on the Mississippi River. There are a lot of songs written about Memphis. Memphis is near the place where the blues were invented on the Mississippi Delta. Memphis is the nearest city to the Mississippi Delta. And that's where this unique American musical form called the blues started, was near Memphis. So Memphis is a city of, of music and probably Memphis is mentioned in more American songs than any other city. There are all kinds of songs that mention Memphis. Even when, um, even groups who have nothing to do with America, when they write songs, they write about Memphis. Um, and um, in the 19th century, there was a great plague in Memphis, yellow fever. Lots of people died. There was great suffering. The Protestant pastors of Memphis left, and the Catholic priests stayed. Roman Catholicism is very, very, very strong in Memphis, and that's the reason. When suffering came, the Catholic priest stayed with the people. I'm a Protestant. I'm not a Roman Catholic. This historical fact embarrasses me, but I have to be honest. I have to tell the truth. Paul says, I was with you through tears. I was with you through suffering. I was with you when bad things happened. You know, a wife dies, a child dies. It's a time of tears. It's a time of suffering. Paul was with them. That was just as important as his teaching. They were being persecuted for the sake of the gospel. Paul was with them day and night. He was crying with them. Paul says, remember this. This is the experience that we had. He says in verse 20 that he did not shrink from declaring to them anything that was profitable, teaching them publicly and from house to house. What does this mean? It means that his teaching was comprehensive. He taught them everything. Uh, I, I happened to teach verse by verse through books of the Bible. I will start in one book of the Bible and I will start at chapter 1 verse 1 and teach through the whole book. And then I'll go to another book. This is what I do in my pastoral ministry. Now, most people don't do that, and I think it's fine to do it another way. The reason I do it that way is because if I only pick and choose the topics I want to talk about or even the verses I want to talk about, then I will have a tendency just to stay with my favorite themes. If I preach through the whole book, then I talk about what the book talks about, not what I want to think about. 
Paul says, I taught you about everything that was profitable. Anything that would help you, I taught you about. And he also says that he taught them publicly, that is, in a public meeting, like at the Hall of Tyrannus, which was probably a kind of school which they rented, but also house to house. And again, sometimes we hear people in the house church movement, which is a wonderful movement that God is really blessing, especially in places like China. He's also blessing it in America too. But sometimes we hear these people who love house churches act like this is the only way we should be meeting as Christians. Paul says, I taught you publicly and house to house. In other words, let's get together and study the Bible. It doesn't really matter where we do it. We can do it in a big public place, or we can do it in a small private place, in a home. Let's just be sure that it's happening. And let's be sure that it's happening everywhere that we go. He says that he solemnly testified to both Jews and Greeks. You know, I love humor. I don't do it here so much because humor depends on nuances of language and it depends on timing and it depends on little changes in language. And so it's hard for me as a native English speaker to say something funny to you as, as native Russian speakers. I may say something funny that I didn't mean to be funny if, if I try to do that. And, and humor is a wonderful thing and it's a great gift and it can be used in the service of the gospel. But probably in our American churches, we care too much about making people laugh. And sometimes we care too much about being entertaining instead of caring about declaring what the Word of God is actually saying. We're dealing with the souls of men and women. We're dealing with eternal happiness or eternal horror. We're dealing with an eternal happiness which can never be lost or an eternal horror which can never be overcome. That's a serious subject. And Paul says when he was in Ephesus, he was serious. He said he solemnly declared these things to them. That is, he taught with great seriousness. Now you notice the contrast which shows that he covered everything. It says that um, he was with them publicly and house to house. He was with Jews and with Greeks. He was in every city. He testified day and night. He talked about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Those two things come together. Repentance addresses the problem, the fact that we're going the wrong way. Faith in Christ addresses the solution that Christ can take us during can take us the right way. There have been some very precious Christians, including some Christians who've been important to me and who've taught me, who downplay the importance of repentance and who really say that repentance is Old Testament. The New Testament is about grace and repentance is really not a part of the gospel witness. That's not true. You Russians are really ahead of Americans in that because Russians usually speak of salvation as repentance. Repentance. Repentance is emphasized in your country in a way that it's not emphasized in my country. I think maybe the Russians are more accurate in their emphases because repentance is a great emphasis in the book of Acts. Repentance is a part of the gospel. Repentance is a part of the New Testament message. Paul preached repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' last sermons including, included a call to repentance. Then he talks about his plans, verse 22. I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me there, but I know that it's going to be hard. I know that it's going to involve imprisonment. I know that it's going to involve persecution. But he says, this is, the part, this is a part of God's will for me. I'm not going to hide from that. I'm not going to... Uh, escape that. 
Um, I knew from the beginning, remember what Jesus told Ananias in chapter 9. He said, Paul is going to suffer for me. His ministry is going to involve suffering. Paul inflicted suffering on Christians. Paul received suffering as a Christian. He caused people to suffer as he fought against Christ. And he endured suffering himself as he spoke up for Christ. Now, uh, he frankly tells them that in verse 25, this is it as far as their personal relationship goes. He's not going to come back to Ephesus. He says quite dramatically in verse 25, you'll see my face no more. No video back then, no Skype, no photographs. Um, no telephones. They were never going to hear his voice again. They were never going to see his face again. You know, we missionaries who live in 2011, we have it so easy. I get on a plane in Budapest. In two hours, I'm in Amsterdam. And then I get on a plane in Amsterdam, and in nine hours, I'm in Memphis. I'm with my children. I'm with my family, or I fly to Atlanta. I'm with my mom. I pick up the phone. I hear my children's voice. I hear my mother's voice. I go on Skype. I see my grandchildren when I talk to them. I go to America at least twice a year. I was in America a month ago. I'll be in America in another month. It's not much of a sacrifice. Do you know that missionaries a hundred years ago and earlier, when they went to the place where there were going to be missionaries, that they packed their belongings in their coffins? A coffin is the, the thing that you're buried in. When you die, they put you in a coffin. They didn't just take trunks with them, big bags with them. They took their own coffin with them. When they say goodbye to their mother, when they say goodbye to their brother, their sister, their best friend, that was goodbye. I'm never going to see you again. I'm never going to hear your voice again. I'll see you in heaven. I will learn about your death three or four months after you die, or you will learn about my death three or four months after I die. This is goodbye. We're never going to see each other again. We don't think that way because we have jet airplanes and we have telephones and we have Skype. Paul was saying goodbye to these people. It's an emotional scene. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. He says, I warned you, I taught you, I taught you the whole purpose of God, Acts 20, 27. I taught you everything. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to be good pastors. I want you to guard the flock. I want you to be a shepherd. I want you to oversee the flock because Christ purchased the church with His own blood. These people are valuable because Christ shed His blood for them. Take care of them. Watch out for them. Be on the alert. Look at verse 29. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Let me tell you something about the devil. He goes to church. Let me tell you something about people who follow the devil. They go to church. The wolf does not stay away from the flock. The wolf wants to be as near the flock as he can because the wolf wants to devour the flock. The wolf wants to swallow the flock. In order to swallow the flock, the wolf has got to get near the flock. He's got to be among the sheep. Don't assume just because you meet somebody at church that they're a Christian. 
don't assume that just because you, you see someone going to church that they're godly. Don't assume that if your daughter meets a boy at church, then it must be okay, that boy must be okay. Or if your son meets a girl at church, that girl must be okay because he met her at church. No, no, that's not what that means. The devil goes to church. The wolf comes to the flock. No, he says in verse 29, that after I leave, the wolves are going to come in among the flock. And there are going to be people, people that you know, people that you liked, people that you had high hopes for, who are going to stand up and they're going to try to draw the disciples away. When I was a student, the most effective student minister left the faith and he became immoral. And the second most effective student leader left the faith and became an atheist. I came to Europe and became involved in a mission because I trusted and loved the character of a man who led the mission. He's leaving his wife for another woman. He had a bad character. He says now he doesn't, he's not sure he believes. A man's theology is always dictated by his morality, and a man's morality is always dictated by his theology. Don't be surprised when this happened, Paul says. You know, you may grow up admiring some great Christian, and that great Christian may turn out to be not such a great Christian at all. Don't let it shock you. Don't let it hurt your faith. The Scripture warns us of these things. And Paul warns the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. So he says in, in 31, he says, so be careful. Keep watching. Remember these three years, I never stopped warning you night and day, day and night. We have a saying in English. I don't know if you have it in Russian, 24-7. Do you have that saying? 24-7. Here's what it means. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It means all the time. That's what Paul says. I was with you, teaching you, warning you, taking care of you, protecting you 24-7. Now, you take care of the people I'm leaving with you 24-7. He says in verse 32, I'm giving you to God and to the Word of God. You're not going to be abandoned. You're going to have God. Can you imagine how the children of Israel felt when Moses died? Can you imagine how the disciples felt when Jesus ascended? Can you imagine how the Ephesians, Ephesian elders felt when Paul said, you're never going to see me again. This is it. This is goodbye. But you've still got God. You still have the Holy Spirit. Paul says, I'm commending you to God. I'm giving you over to God, verse 32, and to the Word which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among the saints. He says in verses 33 and 34, I haven't wanted to take anything from you. I didn't want money from you. I didn't want to dress like somebody else. I didn't want to have the money that somebody else had. You know, if I don't know how many of you will go into ministry, but if you do go into ministry, you're going to minister to people who have good jobs and who make money. They're going to drive nicer cars than you do. They're going to have nicer houses than you do. If you're in ministry, you're not going to get rich in ministry, not unless you do the wrong thing. And you need to be at peace with that. You need to, you need to understand that your reward is not going to come in this life. You're not going to be rewarded in this life. Your reward is going to come later, and it'll be worth waiting for. Paul said, I didn't want anything that belonged to anybody else. That's why I work with my own hands, 
so I could earn my own food, so I could earn my own clothes, I could earn the place where I stayed. And he says in verse 35, in everything I worked hard. He says in the epistles, I labored and I strived. Let me tell you something else about the ministry. The ministry is an easy place to hide. You don't always have somebody watching you all the time. You don't go to a shop and stay at that shop from 9 to 5 and you're expected to sell the things in the shop. You don't go to an office and you're expected to do certain jobs on the computer for your boss. Many people in ministry get to determine what they do during their day. And you know what? I hate to say this, but there are a lot of people in ministry who are lazy. There are a lot of people in ministry who, who run away from hard labor. Paul says ministry which is done right is hard work. One reason it's hard work is because it never ends. When do we ever see anything, everything in a text of Scripture where we say, you know, I'm going to teach on that, but I already see everything there. I already understand everything there, so I don't study anymore. When do we ever speak to all the non-Christians that we know? When do we ever, we ever teach young Christians all the things they need to be taught? When do we ever spend enough time with the people that we're supposed to be ministering with or ministering to? Our job is never done. Our job requires hard, hard work. There needs to be a Sabbath in our life, one day in seven. But six of those days, we labor and strive, hard, hard work. This is Paul's testimony. Now, in verse 35, we see something very surprising. In English, we have certain Bibles which have letters in red. I don't know if you do that in Russian, but... Those letters in red are the words that Jesus said while he was on earth. And in Acts 20, 35, Paul quotes the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, Christ said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, here's the interesting thing about that quote. It's nowhere else in the Bible. When we look at the book of Matthew, we don't see those words. When we look at the book of Mark, we don't see those words. We, see the book of, we look at the book of Luke, we don't see those words. When we study the Gospel of John, Jesus never says those words. So what does this mean? It means that Paul and the other apostles, the other Christians who lived in the first century, had access to a fund of quotes from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ which were not written down in the Gospels. Now, occasionally, someone tries to make a lot of money by publishing a new Gospel. As a matter of fact, last, last Wednesday night, one week ago today, I had dinner with a wonderful German family in Budapest. Godly Christians, but Christians who hadn't been taught a lot. The wife brings out a book, and she shows it to me. She showed me that she told me that another Christian had told her that she should read this book. The name of the book was the Gospel of Judas. She said, "Have you read this book?" I said, "No." She said, "Would you read it?" I said, "No." She said, "Why not?" I said, "Because that book is spiritual pornography." I don't want to read the book. It's garbage. It's rubbish. She was shocked. She took the book and she did what the Ephesians did in Acts 19. She took it to the trash can and she threw it away. I didn't tell her to throw it away. It's her property. She can do anything she wants to with it. But when she heard my opinion of the book, she threw it away. The Gospel of Judas pretends to be a book about what Jesus said and did by Judas. Of course, it's not. It's a forgery. It's lies. It's not true. But it is true that there were things that Christians in the first century knew, which Jesus said and Jesus did, which were not written down by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. 
Here we have an example of this. Paul quotes from the mouth of Jesus, but he quotes from an oral tradition. Paul knew people who knew Jesus. Paul knew people who heard Jesus speak. You can just imagine Paul who never met Jesus, who never heard Jesus, when he was with people who did know Jesus, who had heard Jesus, Paul must have said, tell me everything. Tell me everything he said, everything he did. This was during a generation when the New Testament was being written. Matthew was writing his gospel. Mark was writing his gospel. Luke probably wrote some of his gospel while he was traveling with, with Paul. John was probably going to write his gospel a little bit later. But Paul heard something that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John never wrote down, and he quotes it. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Okay, so this is something Jesus said, which is reported in the book of Acts, but it's not reported in the four Gospels. But before we leave it, we've got to ask ourselves the question, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? Have we really experienced that? We have this thing in America called the lottery. They also have it in Hungary. I don't know if you have it in Russia. Of course, I would never buy a lottery ticket because it's a form of gambling. It's also stupid. As a matter of fact, we have a saying, gambling is a tax on stupidity. You don't win if you're a gambler. You're going to lose money if you gamble. You have much more of a chance of being struck by lightning than winning the lottery. Much more chance. And yet these poor people, they buy lottery tickets. Now, I would never buy a lottery ticket, but I do dream and I do fantasize. And sometimes, I don't gamble, but I do dream. <laughs> and sometimes I think, what if I won the lottery? And I wonder if I would have the guts to give it all away. Not half of it away. Not 90% of it away, but all of it away. Wouldn't it be great if someone won the lottery and they had the courage to give it all away? That would be such a fantastic thing. That would be more fantastic than winning the lottery. You know, most people who win the lottery, they win tens of millions of dollars. Five years later, they're not happy. They're very, very unhappy. It's like it brings a curse with them. But who of us really believes that it really is more blessed to give than to receive? And how many of us have really experienced that, the joy of that, the joy of giving things away? of giving up our right to things, of not having the responsibility of owning things, but having the joy of giving things away. This is the way Jesus lived. This is the way Paul lived. This is what Jesus said, and this is the way Paul quoted Jesus. Verse 36, they kneel down and they pray together for the last time. Then they embrace one another, they kiss, and they weep, and they cry. They're especially upset because he told them, you're never going to see me again. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150.
mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300, or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.